Well, I wish I could say that I uh, taught our next speaker everything he knew, but the fact is that uh, I've learned a thing or two or a hundred since he's become the uh, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. <coughs> so our final speaker today is Michael Snyder, who's the Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. Prior to that, Michael served as for 14 years as a Chitney County Forester, providing land stewardship assistance to private landowners and municipalities. He's also taught for 12 years, uh, two courses in forestry at the University of Vermont, and continues his work and uh, and to write for in the column Woodwise column for the Northern Woodlands Magazine. Previously, he worked in forest ecosystem science at the Hubbard Group Experimental Forest, and Michael received both his bachelor's and master's degrees in forestry from the University of Vermont. Please welcome Michael Snyder. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all. Uh, having, uh, having been a, an undergrad, a graduate student, research staff member, uh, lecturer in the faculty here uh, at Rubenstein School, um, uh, of course, I'm delighted to come back. I miss it, and I'm very happy to have a chance to come back. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Erickson's uh, keynote, which uh, really set the stage well, I think, uh, laying out all of this list of excuses for not collaborating, and then turning it around and showing us how we can, we can actually make good on that. Um, it's stimulating, and I thank you for that, John. Also, uh, hearing Patrick and David, you can, I hope you can get some quick sense of uh, the pleasure that I have to work on a leadership team at the agency with Secretary Markowitz and the caliber of these guys. Uh, and for me to come in, as Patrick alluded to, and you know, with this forest thing, and then David backs it up, and you know, honestly, I was concerned, I'm very concerned taking that position, that, well, who am I gonna be working with? And what are their priorities? And how do they see the world? Uh, and I can tell you that this has really been uh, one of the best parts is to see how well this whole forest thing uh, resonated. And uh, it didn't take Patrick but a, a week or so to be on it. Uh, I think David uh, uh, knew all this all along, but just uh, he, he, he played his cards a little closer. But clearly you can see that it's resonating. Uh, it's a theme for us at the agency. And it's, it's, uh, I'm really happy to, to share this time with them so that you all can get a glimpse into that. This, uh, and, and this is about monitoring and science and forest ecosystems. So to have that kind of leadership from those two branches of, of, our, of our agency, um, understanding that, supporting it, it, it's really wonderful. So thank you both as well. Uh, as I uh, look around, I'm also encouraged to see, uh, to, I want to acknowledge the, the significant presence of agency staff here, uh, and uh, at, not just out of interest, but because it's part of Vermont Monitor Cooperative. And, uh, and indeed, uh, there's probably a dozen or so FPR managers and staff here, and I want to acknowledge them and thank them for their, their presence. So I want you to know there's a bunch of other staff who are out working today still. Uh, <laughs> not all here. Um, good mix, good balance. Um, and then also, when I look around, having worked in forestry in one way or another in, in Vermont for going on 30 years now, you know, I, I know a lot of you. I've had the pleasure of meeting and working with so many of you. I see Max, a former student, went big. Uh, and uh, you know, I look around and I just think, when I recognize the combined experience and wisdom, frankly, the, the human forest-aware horsepower that's in this room, uh, I'm thrilled, excited, and frankly, humbled. So thanks for what you all do, and thanks for the chance to, to affording me the chance to be here to, to share a few uh, ideas of my own on these topics. Uh, I want to, uh, I guess I'd begin with sharing with you um, our statutory charge in, in the department that I'm asked to lead. Uh, so in Vermont statutes, it, it, they're, they're for these pieces of state government, this is po policy and purpose. So the enabling statute for forest parks and recreation, re recreation says, um, well, we are here to encourage economic management of Vermont's forests, to encourage economic management of Vermont's forests to conserve and improve its, to maintain, conserve, and improve its soil, control forest pests, and to the end, that forest benefits, and then it gives a whole series of forest benefits, describes them, uh, are sustained and, and promoted. That's a pretty tall order. I think it's a really important one, 
and it says nothing, zero, about science. It says nothing about monitoring or science, scientific method. Uh, it says economic management to, to maintain benefits. And there's a few points where it, it repeatedly mentions soil productivity, which I think is fascinating. But, you know, that's a tall order, a really important one that links ecology, society, and community. Uh, but it says nothing about how do we do this or the role of science. And so that's where being a commissioner can be really fun because you get to be in charge. And I say that it is part of it. And because of other places it, it says in statute the powers and duties of the commissioner. And as Ed O'Leary will tell you, it's an absurd level of authority. Yeah, right, Ed? <laughs> and uh, so I would use that authority to say this, that we cannot possibly meet that statutory charge. We can't do it without science and management. Monitoring science and management. We can't. So we're, I think the management piece comes clear, economic management. But I'm deeming, I'm saying, I know I can say this with a lot of uh, other sorts of authority uh, and backing, that we can't meet that charge. And, and we never have and never would without science and monitoring. And, specifically the role of Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. Um, so that's a good place to begin. I want to just tell you that you, we, are needed in this regard. Absolutely critical. Especially given increasing and emerging threats to forests, to forest health, to the very existence of forests. Um, I'm not gonna go on at length. I think we are all aware, we've heard some today already of the, the threats from a variety of fronts, conversion of forests, invasive organisms, um, climate change effects, right? So clearly we need it, given the threats facing us. But I'd also say we need science, monitoring and science to guide our policy and management, given not just those threats that are emerging, but given what's something else, that, else that's emerging, which is new, new and strengthened um, awareness of, appreciation for, and reliance on forests. Um, this is, over the last three years as commissioner, I would say the most important thing that I've noticed is that we really are experiencing something of a renaissance around the importance of forests. And again, it comes back to the leadership of these gentlemen being able to stand up here and talk about it credibly. Uh, that, so, so we now know that forests matter. More and more we know that. And we're, giving, we're establishing that more and more. Uh, many of you have known that, but I'm talking to society at large, that we have this growing awareness and reliance on forests. Witness our very active and very important working lands initiative. The whole idea of elevating forests, the working forests, recognizing that forests have been working for us long before there were sheep or cows or even salmons. We understand the ecological functions of forests and that that's working, but we're talking about this other kind of working forest, the working landscape of people working on the land in a way that sustains the land and leads to human prosperity. That's a really uh, important resonating initiative right now. Even in times of significant economic difficulty, uh, Governor Shumlin and the legislature are putting money into investing in the forest enterprise. Businesses, that make it possible for people to steward their lands well so that all those for forest benefits accrue to society. So given the threats, and now giving us, once again, we're looking to forests to kind of bail us out in so many ways. That's a lot to ask of forests. And to me, that just makes the case that all the more that we need science and monitoring to kind of keep track of what's going on and then forecast change and help us better refine our strategies for protecting what forests do. So, um, I want to start maybe with a, uh, beyond that, to, to point to this theme, where we have a charge for these talks, but then backing up the theme of this conference is about new collaborations uh, and, and, uh, and emerging forest needs. Let's start with the last part of that theme, which really caught my eye as I was thinking about this. Given our long-standing fascination with what? Our needs. I think it's interesting to frame it as forest needs. It didn't say needs for forest research or needs, it says forest <coughs> needs. I don't know if that was intentional. Knowing Jen, it probably was. But, but whatever, it's still really interesting. And it's different, 
It's a, and I think it's probably a helpful perspective for us to think in terms of what does the forest need? If we get that, I would submit we know that forests probably don't need us, we need them. So if we want to meet our needs, we probably ought to have in mind how forests function and what forests kind of need to continue to function and provide for that. So I, I thought that was a nice place to start, and I'm just saying let's keep that in mind as a perspective. To think of this as, you know, as we contemplate changes or strengthening collaborations and new approaches to science in support of forest ecosystems, that's probably a good way to be, a, a good lens through which to see it. Um, so let's, let's indeed understand forest needs. Now the first part of the theme, new collaborations. Um, I would start by saying, and I think Jen in her opening remarks made reference to this, uh, let's not forget the existing collaborations. I don't think anyone's suggesting that we need new collaborations because the existing or old ones don't work. Uh, so let's pause for a moment and I would say, let's acknowledge the existing ones. What did Jen say? 170 collaborators in this project, 50 some organizations. That is truly impressive. And let's, I would encourage you all to think about strengthening those existing collaborations. I will move on to new collaborations. But strengthening them through you know, efficiencies of organization and process, leveraging individual strengths and collective strengths, like being really strategic about what we're good at, who's good at what, and putting those things together to leverage those strengths towards better outcomes. Uh, so I just charge, you know, encourage to think about like strengthening the collaborations that exist, building on them and making them better. Uh, I saw some reference to, well, are there some that don't work and we should, that's good thinking. Um, and I, I, I'm guessing that that's, that's at least some of the focus of this conference here later today, is to think about, well, how do we do this better, the existing collaborations, et cetera. That's pretty impressive. But I would say that, to move along, it is also wise to consider, oh, what are the, the new collaborations that are possible? Uh, I have a few ideas. I'm happy to try to share some of those with you. Uh, I, uh, I realize, I, I want to save a little time and get to some another list of kind of priority areas, issues of priority for us and areas of need. I'll get to that. But I'm going to start with this piece of new collaborations. And I'll say that my suggestions for new collaborations may be a little bit strange, and they may not even be all that new. And I don't mean to suggest that you've never thought of them, and I'm the only one who has. But I, I really think they're important. And indeed, I've heard from everyone who's spoken today, in some way or another, some kind of, at least indirect reference to these kinds of new collaborations. More about what are we doing inside the box of BMC, uh, less about what are we doing within the box of DMC and what it does, and more about what are the inputs to that box of the, the workings of DMC, and what are the outputs, most particularly. So, how do we understand what needs are, what are we responding to, That's, those are the inputs. I think we want to look at new collaborations there, for sure. And then, how are we spitting this stuff out? What's coming up? How are we informing policy and management? Who's benefiting? Who are we connecting with? So the outputs to this, this box of DMC work. Um, so, and I'll, break, I'll break it down for you quite simply. I think these are the following areas that I would suggest are important new collaborations, new in some way. Students of all ages and grades, um, really, um, there have to be better curricular connections. I think this thing is a gold mine, but it's not. If, if <coughs> it's not, it's just a bunch of data, right? So I'm really thinking about which data, and then what are we going to do with it? How are we going to analyze, synthesize, integrate, and then speak? Meet Commissioner Mayor's charge of doing something with it, of informing folks, of making some decisions and advocating for changes. So, starting with students, and I say of all ages and grades, I really think that there's, and I, I expect that there's things that I'm not aware of that are happening, and I salute you for that. But I'm really, I was asked to be somewhat provocative, and here I go. We need to make those curricular connections strong, okay? Uh, I believe that forests are the great integrators. They just aren't. They are expressions of everything else in the natural environment. They are vegetative expressions that combine so many other biological, physical, chemical uh, components of ecosystems and the interactions, right? So forests then are supremely and uniquely well suited as uh, integrated, interdisciplinary, experiential teaching and learning opportunities. And BMC is this powerhouse of information that's that could be better coupled with those curricular elements. So, new collaborations with, I'm gonna just call it students. 
Similarly, but somewhat different, would be new collaborations with managers, the people who, who make decisions that affect the landscape. The people who are, so many people make decisions that affect the landscape, including landowners, and I'll get to that. But let's focus on, really, a more concerted effort to collaborate with managers. And that's really big on the input side, too. What do we need to respond to? What are the needs of managers? What are, we, what are our challenges? And I'm going to talk about some of those a little bit later on a short list of what we need. But I think that's another area of uh, need in increased collaboration and perhaps building new collaborations, mechanisms for communication, really, with managers. And a two-way communication. So that we're hearing from managers, helping inform the work that we do in science and monitoring, and then uh, on the other end as well. So finding new collaborations through strengthened mechanisms of communication to inform the whole process, inputs and outputs. Am I making any sense so far? Good. The last area uh, of uh, new collaboration would continue on the theme, which is landowners. So uh, Vermont, you saw some numbers earlier. Uh, Four and a half million acres of forest, 70 some percentage, seven, pushing 80% of the state covered with forest. 85%, no offense, Colleen and our good partners from the US Forest Service, 85% of the, and I can say no offense, Mike Frazier and our agency lands function, 85% of the state is, is owned by private you know, families in general, private landowners. Uh, any idea how many, how many landowners in Vermont? 80, 90,000 landowners, okay? I'd suggest that that's pretty powerful. Um, they make decisions, they make, they control activity on the land, they make decisions about the fate of the land in the future, they vote, they buy, they raise children. This, this powerhouse of forests, it, we're overlooking this whole demographic, and they're the ones that most matter. So, this is really where I'm excited. I'm figuring this, this connection between the work of the MC and landowners. We mentioned students and managers, now this is the last piece. I've got to think that there's an app for this. Right? <laughs> really. Um, and someone's got to help us, or, or multiple apps. I'm imagining, envisioning some sort of a web-based interface for landowners that connects just as simply, if nothing else, the data. But more, we want it to be more. So new ways, digital ways, of connecting landowners with forests through science. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I just think there's something here. Imagine uh, some sort of digital annotated maps of, say, our state forests and state parks. So imagine uh, being able to plan a trip on the long trip, a hiking trip, say. And then being able to, as part of your planning for that outing, uh, pull up online or even on a, on a portable device these electronic maps that are not just a graphic depiction of the place, but links to VNC data and analysis and outcomes. So that you're paint, basically painting a, a virtual tour of this, where you're gonna go, what forest you're traveling through, what, what is their composition, what's their history, what's going on in them and why. Um, I believe that people will, that will resonate with people. I think people would love stuff like that. And it has the, 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 in, the improved, the additional outcome of just wait, raising awareness. So there's the information and that's direct to them and, and their interest on, on the ground, but I just think that we are sort of losing this. We're seeing this increasing uh, awareness of forests, but this would be a mechanism to help connect people. It breaks my heart to some extent to imagine uh, us giving computers to people to <laughs> see the forest. Um, and for a long time, I was really, really grumpy about that. <laughs> that no, no, we want them outside. I've actually given up on that. And I'm saying, you know what, let's go with that. And I think that if we give them this, they will eventually get tired of the digital medium and they'll want to go see the real thing. And I think that there's a real strength here that, that without a whole lot of investment, we can probably capitalize on I'm aware that within the school, and I think even in PMC, there, are, uh, there is some effort to, or interest in expanding use of social media uh, in, in BMC. I think Bob and others have been looking at it for use specifically with recreation. Tracking use and, and, and uh, uh, attitudes, desires, et cetera. And I, I encourage that's great. And that's a good start. I'm just simply saying let's go beyond that to the bigger picture of forest health, forest structure and function, how forests operate, mm -hmm. and, and find new ways, creative, clever ways to couple this stuff with the people out there on the ground.
So I want to lastly just cover a, a short list of gifts, giving some thought, taking some input from our department, etc., and kind of boiled it down to a, a, a short, relatively short list, six, six seven items um, that to answer, address the specific question of what are the emerging uh, needs for forest management policy going forward over the next five to ten years, I think is the term. Well, I would start with kind of a big one that at the risk of speaking out of turn for David or Patrick or Deb, Secretary Markowitz, I I'm going to say, and some agency folks, Larry in particular, will, will not be surprised to hear me say this. I think that we need strength and capacity at the agency around quantitative analysis, assessment, interpretation. Uh, I think we're really lacking, and no, we have some great people. DEC is filled with them. Uh, we have a bunch. Uh, Fish and Wildlife has a bunch. These, it's not a slight on our people or what they try to do. I just really feel badly that we need to beef up. We have need for just quantitative capacity. And I'm thinking that that's a collaboration, that maybe we don't have to reinvent it, that maybe we can work better. Um, that's a service, if you will, that could be provided to our agency staff more and better. Statistics. Uh, interpretation uh, of, of the hard data. I think we could use some help with that, and I think that's a tremendous role for the university and DMC in particular. Then, more topically, sort of that's across that, all issues. The issues of note, many have been mentioned here today, and I'm not going to dwell on them. I'm happy to speak further about the details or of, of the needs, but clearly around invasive organisms. Plants, insects, fungi in particular. These are significant threats to forest ecosystem function and health. Uh, we have real issues. You heard well from, from Ryan earlier, uh, and uh, you know we have forest health staff here, uh, and it's no secret to them that this this is a real threat. And I think more we have to just keep at that, both in the ways of tracking, monitoring, tracking, and understanding what these problems are. But then, really, because mostly in part because that's so depressing, um, we need to think more about what we're going to do about it. So. So refining our strategies for responding uh, to invasive threats. Uh, hydrologic resiliency, the role of forests in hydrology. Uh, I knew David would speak very well to that. He did, and I'll leave that alone for now, but I want to underscore it. It's an absolute priority. Hydrologic resiliency and water quality, and the connection, the roles and connections of forests. Uh, backing that, substantiating that, and again, going beyond that to help us think about um, new mechanisms and strategies in management that will inform uh, our, our, our policy directions. Renewable energy, David touched on that as well. We certainly have ambitious goals around renewable energy for the state, uh, and, and particularly there's a role for woody biomass, uh, and there are major questions about supply availability, the wood supply to fuel those renewable energy uh, facilities, both thermal and electric uh, applications, uh, so we need help with that. And then long-term effects on forests, uh, health and productivity from harvesting in general, but particularly with our interest in advancing and developing and expanding uh, woody violence. Using wood to, you know, we have a long history in this state of using wood for energy. You know that, right? Mostly thermal applications. And we're proud of that. We're a national leader in wood energy in schools and other institutions. A third or more of Vermont school children go to schools heated by wood, grown mostly sustainably and managed and uh, harvested locally. That's fantastic. We're a national leader there. Now we're looking at electric and how does it fit in? There's encouraging pieces there, but there are also some unanswered questions or less well-answered questions. So about long-term forest productivity, do we have enough and can we keep it going? While meeting our other needs for wood products, more durable wood products. Uh, the role of all of that in uh, atmospheric uh, CO2 mitigation. Uh, and then long-term effects on site capital, nutrient uh, productivity of the soils, but beyond soil health or, or nutrient capital, to include the hydrologic role of uh, down and woody material, uh, habitat functions, et cetera. So what are these long-term effects? We don't fully know. It's, it's very difficult to study, and I think we have conflict, literature's conflicting in so many cases, so I want to press that those are real needs and we need to keep at them. And that's a, an ongoing need uh, that you can help us address. So the quantitative piece, invasives, hydrologic resiliency, and water quality, renewable energy, uh, forest inventory and analysis, 
You hear about FIA, we want to continue with these kinds of forest uh, inventory analysis, growth and, and volume predictions, assessment of what we have and how much, where it's going. But we want to see a closer link with, uh, with DMC data, maybe get FIA and DMC data to be more sort of tied in together. Uh, and uh, do it, it, maybe build a more robust system that's more repeatable and that we're, we're doing more frequently. We really need to have a handle. I think things are going to start to change very quickly, and we want to have a better handle. And I would say that that's another area of need. Uh, uh, it's very, it's a, I find it very hard to, to speak in, 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 in groups uh, about this, the next topic in a state like Vermont, but that's urban forestry, the, the role of the urban tree canopy. Uh, we're, we, we don't tend to think of ourselves as urban, but we really have a growing proportion of the state in this land use. It's very important land use. There are tremendous opportunities through green infrastructure to manage stormwater, air quality, <coughs> through plantings, to maintaining healthy vegetation in built environments. Uh, that's really good, and we're seeing uh, growth there and, and advancement, and we're very pleased with that. Uh, I believe that through the uh, I tree uh, component that, that's being used. There's some DMC work there. And we have this high elevation monitoring. Um, we can envision maybe more uh, monitoring in the link in between so that we have full monitoring of across what we call the forest continuum from the built environment, largely in the valley here, through the foothills and into the higher elevation so that we can have paint this full picture of what's going on in that forest continuum from the city to the tops of the mountains. Um, near, near the end, there's another one that I'm very excited to, to talk about and challenge with because I think it's a little bit outside the norm, but I'm starting to see some of it creeping in and, and I want to underscore the importance there. And that is, we need help with, we, we are very happy to be encouraging and promoting outdoor recreation. We see tremendous upsides for economic development, human and community health, and environmental awareness and literacy through outdoor recreation. It's part of our mission as well, forest parks and recreation. Um, that's why I get to say I'm the commissioner of fun. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, so we're, we're re-emphasizing that, reorganizing around it in our department, and, and that's largely in response to uh, a wildly burgeoning public demand for, for, for recreation use of public lands uh, and support on uh, public uh, recreation on private lands. So we clearly have to be ahead of this. We, we want to support that, but not at the risk of screwing up the system. So ecological, biological effects and impacts of increased recreational use. Um, that side of things, we really need some help there, I think. We have, there's legitimate questions being asked, particularly when we're trying to advance, say, mountain biking, backcountry skiing. Uh, those are happening in relatively sensitive environments and uh, kind of new uses. Uh, that have many great outcomes, but not if they screw up the forest system. So we need some help, I think, in thinking about how to develop a monitoring scheme there to understand those impacts and make sure that we're on the right track. Um, climate change, yeah, we, we need to continue to uh, think about our adaptive strategies. Uh, we're working on that. You're working on that. We need to combine. Just, just want to make that. I'm not going to go on about that, but clearly, um, we need to continue. We need to. I would suggest. What are, I'd ask, what are, can we identify the suite of the most powerful indicators of change and sustainability? There's sort of two categories. I know there's a lot of work on these sorts of indicators, but what's the smartest package of indicators that we can monitor and track to use them to continually, what, re react, respond, adapt, to, to revise and refine our strategies for, for management, right? So what are those? I don't know. I, I, I have some ideas, but I've asked this group. You know, so can we identify what's the, what are the things we should measure that will help us understand where things are tracking, help guide our decisions about how to respond to those changes, uh, and do so in some credible way? Uh, because you know, to me, refining our abilities to forecast uh, future, what the forest, composition, structure, function, and response. So can we characterize the present state of the forest, better refine our abilities to predict where it's heading? For it's a forester. You know, that's what forestry has always been. It's about competition and change and managing change uh, and, and kind of planning for change. Well, that's what we need to do uh, and more and more. Um, and so uh, to me, 
forecasting and then continually adapting to what we see uh, and being intelligent about our tinkering uh, is, is paramount and monitoring and science are absolutely essential to our being able to do that. So for us it is about intelligent tinkering, Patrick, uh, with a nod to Alva Leopold. And, uh, and in order to do that, as I said at the beginning, we can't meet this charge of intelligent tinkering without monitoring the science. And so I'm hoping that that, that sort of paints a little bit of a picture from our perspective at the department. And again, I thank you very much for the chance to speak. Questions for Commissioner Snyder? Before we break for lunch. Probably everybody's been smelling. <laughs> All right, with that, a round of applause for all our speakers.